Um, we're going to try to get started on time so we don't run out of time and we can get to all of the topics that we wanted to cover today. So um, welcome. Thank you for coming. This is a panel on content strategy. Um, I'll let everyone introduce themselves, but um, I am Pam Barone. I'm a client service manager for Previous Next, which is a Drupal shop in Sydney. Um, I am also a former content editor at um, a number of media websites that had horrible um, content editor experiences, sort of lack of a content strategy, and so ever since I've come onto the other side of the fence, I've been really, really interested in this topic and how we can um, empower our clients to fix it. So I'll let each of you introduce yourselves and if you could maybe just talk a little bit about sort of how, how you do content strategy in your job and, and, and sort of what your area of interest is. Okay, uh, hi everyone, I'm Angus Gordon and I work for Weave. Um, Weave is a, an agency here in Melbourne and we basically do two things. We do content strategy and we do Drupal. Um, so I'm a content strategist. Um, how I do content strategy as part of my job really depends a lot on the project, um, but I guess something I'm particularly interested in is using the inherent um, capabilities of Drupal to produce really, really great content experiences. Um, and I guess that's something I'll be talking a bit more about in, in, in a talk this afternoon, so I won't get too much into it here. But. Hello, I'm Susan Cowan. I'm the owner of Weave. Um, Angus is our lead content strategist. Uh, the way I do content strategy is, in many respects, just um, helping Angus, but I'm kind of at the pointy end uh, as uh, I'm the person who sells it. Um, and so uh, that's a whole other skill that we can uh, get into a little bit later on. Um, just starting in 2015, I've moved the agency from what we would have called probably a digital agency with a Drupal focus and some content strategy. I've decided to bite the bullet and we're pretty much a content strategy agency now with some Drupal. So um, that's us. Hi, I'm Michelle Stevens from Technocrat. I'm the chief strategist there, which means I uh, do anything that comes to mind probably and annoy most of my developers. Uh, I approach content strategy more from a discovery perspective. As in, in my view, navigation is simply static search. And search is really the core of what we do on the internet now. It is about what you're looking for and how, that, how those results return. Um, it, it could be said that I no longer believe in home pages and uh, I prefer dynamic creation of content on the fly. So that's what we're specialising in at the moment. Um, I think the first thing to sort of cover off is um, the four of us obviously very strongly believe that content strategy is a very important part of your content management project. And I think a lot of us have had that sort of um, moment where you you know, you get a project and you're starting the project and, and your client sort of says, well, no, you're building the Drupal site, we'll handle the content. Um, that's not something you need to worry about. Build the site. When it's done, you call me, and then we'll start entering the content. Well, that often works out very badly. It rarely works, and it often works out very badly. So um, I guess if you could each do sort of your elevator pitch about, um, it, I mean, it's sort of hard to believe sometimes that we still have to explain this, but we still have to explain this, so. Uh, I guess my, my elevator pitch is to, really to, to those of you who are in agencies when you're selling projects to clients, that every client has a pain point around content, um, and that might be SEO, um, it might be accessibility, um, it might be that they're in, it might be a pain point they don't realise they have yet because they're um, planning a huge migration of content from, say, a static site to a Drupal site, um, and they're somehow expecting that migration to just magically happen. And also, as Pam pointed out, the, the content will magically get improved at the same, you know, at the same time it's being migrated. So, um, so really, um, you know, the, the way the way to Pitch content strategy is really to find out what, what you know what people's pain point is around around content and 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 and, and really um, really emphasise that content problems don't solve solve themselves that, that they they really need to be thought about sort of early in the project at the same time as you're thinking about technology and, and design and all the other things that we that we think about. Uh, well, my um, 
elevator pitch is often uh, to developers. They, they've um, been uh, my best source of uh, work, or our best source of work. Um, so an organisation's replatforming and the developer having known um, uh, that uh, content is a pain point for them in any large development. Um, uh, we now find that um, developers are very kindly um, selling us in to their, to their uh, clients to, um, to help with that pain point. Um, but talking directly to clients, um, it, it is definitely about the pain points. And often, if people have been down this path before, um, they know that um, they might have had a lot of... They know that in, in a big organisation in particular, there's not one person who owns all the content. The content's owned by all of these individuals and they're quite siloed and they're quite precious. Um, I think an intranet is probably the very best example of that. Um, and really uh, offering the service where you can, uh, that, that, that content strategy itself, well, as we said, no one ever asks for a content strategy, really. They want something else. Um, that actually engaging all of those content owners um, can be the role of a content strategist and that can be in itself quite um, uh, attractive to an organisation. I would like to be a little bit more controversial with the people that we approach. I really don't think that there is any one person or, or most people in any organisation really don't know what's on their site. One of the very first things that you need to do is to re-engage your clients with what is actually there. You're probably looking at the content administrators or content editors as being the only people who really understand what is actually on that site. A good, a good damn scraping is what you need to do to actually get it into some format without pictures and navigation to help people understand exactly what they've written over a period of time. Many sites are there for two to three years and they grow organically and mapping breaks, journeys break, no matter how great we are at personas in the beginning. So take the content off, do a good scraping, get it into Excel and have everybody sit down and have a look through it and see whether it actually makes sense. And the chances are it won't. So uh, that is the best way in my view to sell content strategy. It's probably a little bit of a, a, a cold fish approach to how you introduce people to this stuff, but they really need to understand what it is that they have and where those holes are before they can start filling them in. I agree. Yes. <laughs> I think, yeah, I think that what happens a lot is that clients know they have a problem, so they know, you know, our website isn't doing something right let's build a new cms and all of our problems will be solved and i think it's a similar thing with accessibility where they'll say well we have a requirement that um content editors can't enter content that's not accessible and you go well <laughs> yeah that, that would be great unfortunately um it's not the case so i think the same thing really shows in cms projects and i know that we struggle as a really technical sort of development focused shop we struggle a little bit with um achieving the balance because I think it's really easy to take something and run with it and then at the very end have something that you didn't really think through. So I guess um, maybe you can answer this Angus but if, if someone comes to you and says right um, help <laughs> what's the first thing you do with maybe like a big um, government organization that has a really big website with a lot of old content no one really knows what's there and no one really knows I think a lot of the, the government projects specifically that we work with it's sort of like they have a budget they know they need a new website, but they don't really have any more of a, of a vision than that. Yeah, I think the first step is, is, is often exactly what Michelle said, is that inventory that, um, and, and you know, it, it's, it, it takes you a little bit to, a bit of a while to realise that most people genuinely don't have any clue what's on their, on their website. Um, and they forget about it five minutes after it's published, so it's even the content authors often don't really understand their full site. So just being able to, and there are tools you can use to do an automatic spider um, of a website, so we use one called Screaming Frog, and there, there are several, several, several ones out there. Um, Screaming Frog, yeah, it's a great, yeah. It's really, it's super expensive too, but yeah, it's, 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 it's really valuable. Um, the, you know, I'd say the bare minimum, if you, if you have, if you have the budget and the time to do a full page by page content audit where you look at every single page on the site and evaluate it by 
you know, criteria of quality and whether it's up to date, whether it's needed, whether it fits in with the overall sort of game plan of the new site and so on. That's the ideal situation, but I'd say the bare minimum you should do is at least get in, the, get in a position where you know how, many, how much content there is on the old site and what broad, what, you know, broadly what types of content um, are there and what how, how much of each. Um, so you sort of know what you're dealing with as a, as a starting point. Um, so that would be my that would be my first step in almost every project. Uh, yeah, I would throw another thing in here. Uh, in 2012, the BBC actually based, launched a, an ontological based site. They've moved all of this all of their site over to this kind of uh, structure. It's called Dynamic Sem Semantic Publishing, and it bases itself on linked data and hubs to pull the content together. When you actually ask a client to start looking at their content and you want to give them a new strategy, you need to give them a reason why. Uh, the BBC found that using ontologies, which is, say, sports, which have football, archery, etc., etc., you can find a case study on it, actually, see me later for a case study. Um, the BBC actually found that creating these sorts of aggregated sites when you're actually working with content was far better for search and it actually created more things that people were looking for on, on, on that back end. So rather than look at content strategy from a static position, do try and look at it from the position of who's looking at it, what are they looking for, and how are people actually finding their way through that content? In the majority of sites, you'll find that uh, their internal search engine isn't even working, no one really uses it, and Google is the only way or step into that site. So in that particular case, that's one, of a very, one very good way to actually get people to really have a good look at whether or not the functions of the site are working. Uh, the BBC, whilst it isn't a very pretty site, worked tremendously well. The first uh, test that they did for that was the Olympics for 2012 with Team GB. So do have a look at the case study and I think it will assist greatly. As far as government is concerned, my two favourite sites in the world, utah.gov and hawaii.gov. They really look at this whole content strategy structure and bring it alive whilst using really beautiful images from, from both states. Very, very different, very beautiful. Uh, governmenttech.com is another good site to look at to really get a good idea of how to approach big, well, not so exciting content and, and accessibility too. And I suppose our poster child is uh, for content strategies, gov.uk. Um, however, uh, the imagery isn't, um, well, it just isn't. <laughs> but I think that will change. I think there'll be pressure to change that. But when we, when we first saw that, it was just um, marvellous just to see content uh, at the forefront with very little um, imagery. Because people don't necessarily think of images as content, it's just beautiful imagery, you know, images images are content, but gov.uk started completely stripped back and I don't think there was any, uh, I don't think they could have actually done it if, um, if it had been um, also a very visually beautiful site. It's visually beautiful to us <laughs> because it's all about content. It did win, it did win a design award, so... Um yeah, and the, I mean, what's great about gov.uk is that, the, you know, you can read, they're very, very public about their whole process and, um, you know, using agile methodology around content creation, not just around development. Um, and, and this kind of lays a focus on user, user tasks. Um, there's a, um, there's a, a UX person called Jerry McGovern, who some of you um, might know of, um, and his, his sort of big, his sort of big thing is that you know websites are about um, effective websites deal really well with top tasks and you know most organisations have sort of six to twelve tasks that account for about eighty percent of their visits and if you can actually if you can actually make those top tasks work um, you know you, you're gonna um, you're going to be satisfying, you know, a, a really high proportion of, of your users. And, and what Jerry McGovern says is that we shouldn't even really be talking about content. We should be talking about tasks and helping people complete tasks. So I guess, you know, in most of the time in content strategy, we're not talking about content for its own sake. We're helping about, we're talking about using content to, to, to a wide, to a, a broader goal, which is helping users actually do do things. Can we, can we just say as well that um, gov.uk had a, a, an absolutely massive, uh, was a massive job. It, it, it combines every government site 
in the UK into one site, and I think the next is the next level is um, I don't know what they call it, county or you know whatever the next level of government is. But it combines the whole of the federal government um, information into one site, so it was massive. And um, as a content strategy, it was enormously successful because it, I think they actually managed to roll it out in. Uh, well, look, I'm going to be wrong. I think it was something ridiculous, like eight months or, or, or you know, something, something tiny, not years. Um, yeah. They got to, yeah, they, they had, I think, they, what, what they called an alpha version or something very, very quickly. So they, you know, it's, 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 very, it's a very agile style process that they use and they, they, they're quite open about the fact that some of their content is you know, beta content. It doesn't, your content doesn't need to be perfect before you push it out. Really? <laughs> Um, also, if, any, if anyone has any questions, feel free to come up to the mic, or if you want to just tweet a question using the Drupal South hashtag, I'll check for that, um, if, you, if you don't want to go up to the mic, but... Oh, good idea. So, um, who here would consider themselves a developer or technical person? Nice, awesome. What about sort of more salesy type roles? Don't be shy. No judgment here. <laughs> and then who is sort of on the, on the client side? Who's here to, to uh, any other, anyone like a content writer? You're strictly doing content for websites? Any other, any content strategists? Yes. <laughs> um, one of the, <laughs> yeah, we should schedule a boss. One of the things that's really interesting about, uh, and you each touched on it, I think that um, content is really the thing that brings together the strategy of an organization and the kind of digital path. So I find a lot of times that you, you know, you can't have a content strategy without having a strategy. So do you face that a lot where you come into an organization and they say, right, so what's our content strategy going to be? And you say, well, what are you trying to achieve? And they say, mm. what, do, what do you do then? Well, and I think a lot of the time, just as we've probably all had the experience that we go in to build a website for an organisation and we sort of ask them, well, who are you and what do you do? And they don't even know the answer to that. And building a website can become a process for them of sort of working out their identity a lot of the time. Um, and I sort of feel that, that it's, it can be the same with content strategy and overall strategy, that the content strategy can actually be a path into working out working out the overall strategy, because if you know what you want to say to people, um, that goes a long way to, towards working out, I guess, what your overall what your overall strategy is. I don't know if you... Yeah, I think, what is the success metric? Every strategy has to have an outcome, you know, you're not going to actually put a whole pile of money into something that you actually have no response for. Those success metrics and helping people understand what they want to achieve and how they're going to measure them is uh, invaluable to being able to sell a strategy or even have anyone listen to you. Because mostly strategy is something that most people think that they've got in the bag. If you ask them what that whole round trip is through strategy and the content and what it is that their users are trying to actually achieve and how they're going to actually tell their boss that they spent this much money on something. Like what's that outcome? So helping your client understand what that measurement is and how to report on that, it makes it easier to actually get through that whole content structure. Um, the interesting thing for me is that when, uh, when people are writing content, um, it, I found this at Foxtel with Presto, that uh, one of the errors that one of the content writers wrote was uh, so movie-based, it was really quite bizarre. It was a space... Uh, 2001 Odyssey reference, and it was open the pod bay doors for an error. Um, so, so even though you can get really excited with these things, they still need to be relevant. They need to be short and punchy. Um, some of you were actually in the accessibility talk with Tim Noonan yesterday. Always remember too, in content, it isn't actually about the amount of words you can get on a page. Um, Tim has to listen to every single word on that page, and uh, that means that it makes it onerous task for him to use some sites. So we do need to also remind uh, the people that we're working with that users aren't necessarily just one type of person and that one type of person isn't just them. It is a very, very easy trap to fall into to think that every single user is just like you. 
just to, to um, you know, follow up on that, content strategy is often as much about reducing content as it is increasing content. In fact, prob probably more, you know, more so. So, and that's that's one of the things that makes content strategists different from content marketers. Um, uh, we we um, um, in Melbourne we have a, a content strategy meetup that has a lot of content marketers involved in it, and so we we spend quite a lot of time talking to content marketers, and they can be great and they can do great things. But you know, one of the things uh, that that makes us different, I think, is that content marketing is always about just producing, well, not just, it's always about producing more content, and um, um, you know. Um, well, we need to produce content for every channel and we need to, you know, we need to just keep pumping out this stuff so that people will engage with it and share with it and so on. Content strategy is about sitting back and saying, okay, what resources do you actually have to produce and then maintain this content? What's going to happen to this content in a year's time? Is it still just going to be sitting on your website? Um, what do you, do you, you know, do you actually have a relevant content that is, um, that is making your search not work because, you know, you've, you've got pages, you've got pages from a, a version, you know, your, your help text is throwing up results from a version of your product that's, that doesn't exist anymore um, when people are actually looking for, looking for the help. So, um, yeah. Um, yes, I love that point about um, it's not always about new content. Um, a content strategy can actually help you find content that is still valuable, still useful, can still be can be repurposed for other for other channels. Um, not that I really like that word. Um, that so that you don't always have to be creating new content because not everything changes every uh, every two years. Um, and I've been working with the I'm a member of the IABC, the International Association of Business Communicators, which is essentially a PR organisation, and that's exactly the strategy um, we been talking about because they've been creating content for years, 20, 30, well, eons really, since they've been, since they started. And that, a lot of that content, a lot of that uh, content is still valuable. A lot of those things haven't changed. And um, so we're looking at repurposing, especially for an organisation that doesn't have a whole lot of, uh, operates with a lot of volunteer staff, um, getting some real value out of that content that, frankly, people have spent millions and, you know, thousands to millions of dollars creating. It's an absolutely massive asset that um, when people re-platform, <laughs> forget that that's their opportunity to really look deeply into it and start getting some value out of it. Uh, a couple of years ago, I heard someone say that content strategy is not, it's not a technical problem, it's a people problem. And I think that um, it, it sort of feels a little bit like you're kind of doing therapy when you're, it's, it's sort of like you're, you know, you're going to the home of a hoarder and saying, right, what do we need and what can, you know, what do we need to keep? What do you think we can get rid of? And I think that, um, you know, even something when you say content should be about how you do the top tasks. What are, how do you get everyone to agree? What are the top tasks? You know, how do you how do you deal with the maybe internal politics or you know, well, the director wants his fo his photo on the, the the front page. You know, like how do you kind of try to navigate those um, those internal battles? Gee, thanks. I'll remember that. So, uh, how do you get around the people problem? Research. Uh, testing. Uh, there's nothing that can, uh, you know, quantity of data when you're actually doing something like tree jack uh, and actually proving that, that something isn't necessarily going to be successful is very powerful. Uh, that is never going to work with the director's photo on a page, I'm afraid. <laughs> that one that one with the, uh, what do they call it, hippos? The uh, people who actually make those decisions who you can't ignore. Uh, I think when you actually work through uh, individual interviews with people and identify who that person is who you need to win over, um, you know, taking your time with them to uh, to work through those problems is important. You know, I'm working with someone at the moment who has a site who's very close to his heart, and unfortunately, a lot of it is uh, is is broken now. So we will actually have to restructure that. It is a very very gentle path that we're leading him down, but we need to lead him down that path nonetheless. Some things we will be successful on, uh, and you've just got to keep trying and trying and trying, and as much research as possible, I think, and as much data. 
And look, I, I have to agree. The, the more um, emotion you take out of it, or the more opinion you take out of it, the better. So, actually, s the starting point, um, especially uh, for us, is to really look how, at how the site's being used now. Look at, especially a very bad site. The search logs can actually turn up amazing information because that's the only way people can find um, what they want. Um, and just uh, and user research, um, telephone interviews, workshops. You know, um, you, you the the thing you find out in big organisations is that you'll be sitting in what seems like a very successful workshop, and everyone's agreed on something, and then all of a sudden, it's all fallen apart because you you don't realise that those two people have never really got on, and they always nod their head in public, um, but really they will do anything to um, uh, to you know to fight each other. Um, so. Uh, the one-on-one, -on -one, uh, uh, really taking the opinion right out of it, focusing on the audience, and then going in with that with that presentation that says, "Look, these are all of the factors that are actually should influence what's going to be on that homepage, what's going to be uh, on in the other um, important areas, and these are the important areas, and these are the top tasks." Yeah. So, getting some numbers. The other thing is. Um just as most people have no idea what's on their website, most people, most people in organisations have never actually watched a person use their website. Um, so if you if you can actually if you have the budget for it and um, and and you know you can you can organise it, um, if you can do some usability testing with the senior stakeholders, actually looking on via a video link or something like that, that can be really powerful. Um, the kind of cheap and nasty substitute for that is just to be brutally honest with them about your own experiences using the website and don't, you know, don't be afraid to, to tell them, look, I, I think you're, um, you know, I think this experience, you know, I tried to do this thing on your website, it's a completely broken experience and let me tell you why. And often people will just, that, you know, they just haven't thought of they just haven't thought of it before because they're they're, they're looking at it from the the organisational point of view, not the customer's point of view. And even even really basic things like, you you, you know your your um your IA is is based on your um your internal org chart, but that doesn't make any sense to to um to ordinary users. Um, that will often be a revelation for people. Won't it? And, and and you know what do, what do you think people do when they look at a menu? How do you think people make decisions about? What link, what, what link on a menu to click on. It's often things they've never even really thought about. So, yeah, just sort of taking them through the process from the point of view of a user can be really, really, really useful. And that trap, of course, of um, basing something on an org chart um, is that the org chart um, changes. We all restructure every seven minutes these days. Um, yeah, and I think the other point about, you know, those internal people problems is that bringing someone else in from the outside is a really nice way to um, try to maybe bridge that gap because I think when it's always just the two people butting heads, um, sometimes getting a third party in and you can even say, look, make us the bad guy. We're the ones giving the bad news, not you. Um, we can we can help you fight this fight. We can be your advocates. Um, and I want to move on. Oh, did you want to say something? Sure. Yes. Um, we had an experience with an intranet. Um, we didn't actually do very much work um, with the client. It was just a very um, small project. But just having that outside view gave them such confidence in their decisions. They ran them past us. We, we told them, you know, what the research was. Um, they brought us into their presentation. We didn't have to say anything. Um, just the fact that we were there was massive because it wasn't just them. Um, trying to tell their bosses um, that things should be different. Yeah, and I, I was told by a client, actually on a job with, with Previous Next, I was, I was told by a client, yeah, your name quite regularly comes up in meetings and we just, 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 just the ways of settling arguments, we just say, oh, Angus, as Angus says we shouldn't do this. Um, so just, just being that person who is supposed to be, who is the, you know, the, the um, presumed expert, um, that's, that's, you know. <laughs> Hopefully a real expert, but you know, take it till you make it. I guess um, it, it, you know, just 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 having that figure on the project can be a useful thing. What would Angus do? <laughs> 
Um, I know that, Michelle, you really wanted to go into the topic of accessibility, and something that you said yesterday in your talk um, stuck with me, which was that when you were working with Presto on the, on the Presto site, um, they sort of thought, well, we don't need to worry about accessibility. Blind people don't watch movies, so, you know. <laughs> I guess the, the larger point there is that, um, you know, what was one of the things that Harriet said this morning as well is that, um, you know, if you presume that because you use something one way that you know how everyone else is going to use it, um, you're often going to be wrong. So I guess um, for our part, we have a lot of trouble having productive conversations about accessibility because, you know, I, I had one government client that, um, you know, we were working with them and the whole time we had had accessibility in mind and we knew we were going to get a Vision Australia audit and we were explaining about PDFs and you knew you really need to make them. Um, you can have them, but you need to structure them well. And, and one of them said to me, oh, I heard Vision Australia don't actually check your PDFs. <laughs> and I said, well, you know, what do you mean? And he said, well, we'll get the certificate anyway. So what's, what, you know, who cares? Uh, and it just, it's sort of mind blowing that um, those are the conversations that, are, that, that we're having. And I actually said to them, so, you know, straight up, are you doing this because you want to have an accessible website or because you want to get the tick? And he said, for sure, we just want to get the tick. So whatever we need to do to do that, you guys do that for us and, and we'll, be, we'll be all good. So, I mean, it's sort of like, where do you even start when you're, when you're up against that kind of mindset? Oh, wow. Um, uh, so Presto, in the first instance, uh, to meet a deadline, and this was uh, two years ago, um, a decision was taken by the Director of Transformation to come back to accessibility. Uh, the first Presto app was actually built in Google Web Toolkit, which is good for nothing except for Google. And uh, that's sorry, just personal opinion. I was a, it was it was a, it was a deeply traumatic experience using GWT to trying to make it accessible or searchable. Uh, the uh, the moment and that Foxtel really became committed to accessibility was the moment that the lawyers were contacted, mm -hmm. and at that point it became very important for them to uh, to to be accessible. And um, you know the second uh, Presto website has been developed and with them saying, well, we want to be AA compliant, we must be AA compliant. Uh, the problem with that is that uh, Foxtel doesn't use closed captionings, which means they don't even meet the single A requirement. Uh, when you actually look at accessibility from the point of view of simply using a checker, you're losing sight of the fact that accessibility in itself with a content strategy actually does make things easy to read. It makes it easier to make, it makes more sense to people and you are, far better off and, and approaching accessibility from a more budget uh, wise position if you are thinking about accessibility in the first instance. You, um, uh, Tim Noonan, Tim says, <laughs> I get to do that all the time. So Tim says that it's easier to design ramps when you actually build your house rather than actually put them on later. And he uses the example of the opera house in that particular regard. Uh, when you are looking at a content strategy or UX in any particular instance, you do actually have to think about personas. And you know, I know a lot of people who um, uh, I know a lot of people who are a little bit uh, cynical about personas. But really, what, what what we're asking you to do when you do that with content strategy or UX is put yourself in the shoes of somebody else. Um, I was saying to Susan just uh, just before that. We had uh, a couple of years ago a site and, and mobile application called Genie, and that mobile application was uh, custom built, but it had to deal with so many different forms of disability that it, it became contextual. So what happens when you're actually writing for someone who uh, can't read or they have a specific issue with recognising numbers? What happens when you're designing an interface for someone who has only one hand? And that same interface has to work for someone who doesn't have the other hand. So when you're actually thinking about how to approach a site from this perspective, the easiest way, I think, is to uh, try and get someone to emotionally connect with how it is for someone else. And, the people who are looking for just checks and boxes are probably some of the hardest people to win over. Um, I usually take that as a, as a personal mission to uh, win them over in this particular regard. I often fail, but I will still beat my head against that brick wall. So please do try to actually look at content from the perspective of, well, what is someone else going to actually view? How is someone else going to view this? How do we actually make it easier for people to see? Um, I'm actually going to use and go divert to something. Um, one of our designers and developers, Jay, uh, often uh, says that clients don't think about uh, what the deeper level content on their site is actually going to look like. You know, you design a couple of uh, 
pages and say, right, well, that's that's all we're going to do. But, you know, he often then sees things like block quotes getting left out of style guides and things like that. I think it's important to, to really look deeply into the types of content that you have and get that peer reviewed so you haven't forgotten anything. And accessibility, accessibility, I say that all the time. So, you know, I say it at the end of every sentence, really. Uh, I... Um did some teaching at RMIT in the early 2000s and I was talking to my students then about um, accessibility and there was a great tool called um, Bobby, I think. Um, and I came to the understanding that if you build, and of course I've always been very content focused, um, although I, I was a designer years ago, um, that if you build for accessibility, or if you create content for accessibility, you're, you're actually um, creating better content for all of us. Um, you know, I'd love to be able to choose whether to read, listen to, or, or you know, um, some other method, I don't know, perhaps just plug it into the back of my head, matrix style, um, some content. There's so much to absorb, you know, and uh, Tim made that great point that, you know, at, at at some point in our, in our lives, well, uh, well, we'll have a disability, but even just in the context of what we're doing, we're unable to do something. So I can't read a book while I'm driving, um, but I can listen to a book while I'm driving. So thinking about the ways content um, can be delivered um, to make everybody's lives, um, uh, make, it all, make it more useful for everybody. And another point that Tim made was that um, blind people using screen readers are, are greatly assisted by having a kind of semantically logical heading structure on a page. And we know, of course, that that's good for everybody. It's good for, it's good for, the, for the design. It's good for the, the predictability, I guess, of, the, of, of how the CSS works on the page. And it's also really, really good for Google. So um, I think there are a lot of those areas where you do get multiple wins by, by making your accessibility right. Um, so, yeah. So when you get a bug report that um, the WYSIWYG doesn't have an H1 style, <laughs> you can explain that that's for a very good reason. Um, and one of the things that, Susan, we talked about before this, and something that I think everyone sort of touched on, is that um, it doesn't have to be this giant, um, long, expensive exercise. And it's something that also Harriet touched on this morning with user journeys. And um, I've certainly had experiences with big consulting agencies doing six month user, user journey exercises and it was another sort of similar to the accessibility thing, it was to tick a box. It was to say, well, you know, we've done that, we never looked at them again, um, we proceeded to build the site the way everyone had assumed we would anyway. Um, I guess, could you each talk a little bit about what are the, what's the kind of um, minimum viable action, to put it in Harriet's words, what's the minimum viable action on content strategy that you think can still really go a long way? Um, I'm actually going to um, tweet a link to a, um, there was a really fantastic uh, webinar that Jeff Eaton gave for, for Gather Content. Uh, Jeff Eaton um, is a well-known person in the Drupal community, but he's also really interested in content strategy, um, and he gave a, a um, yeah, he gave a, basically a free webinar for Gather Content, which I don't know if any of you have used, it's essentially a tool for gathering content, uh, funnily enough, um, <laughs> um, for, for a project. But, but, but anyway, the, the, the talk, he, he basically broke it down into, well, these are, these are the sort of five fundamental things we need to know about the content for a project um, before we get started on, on a build. Um, and um, so I hope I can remember the five things he said. I think the first one was the game, what he called the game plan, which, which you might call, a, I guess, the strategy with a capital S. It's, you know, why are we doing this? What are we, you know, um, um, who are we doing it for? And you know, we, um, in a broad sense, how how are we how are we going to go about it? Um, he, he he talked about the inventory, which is what we've already brought up. That sense of what what, con what content do you already have? Um, he said we need to know we need to know a content we need to have a content model, which is I'm going to be talking about this afternoon. So a content model is essentially the types of the, the con in, in Drupal terms, the content types and the fields within those content types. How the content is going to be structured in the, the sort of the back end of the CMS. Um, he says you need to know, know that, um, that the presentation model, what he calls the presentation model, which, which is essentially how content is going to be presented to the end user. Um, 
for so you know what kind of pages you have, what your information architecture is, um, all that kind of thing. And then finally, the, he he says you need to know the work the workflow, which um, is basically how content within an organisation, how content comes into being, um, and what steps it has to go through before it's published on a website. And I guess I'd also add to that what happens to content after it's published on a website. When does it get reviewed? When does it get deleted? And, and so on and so forth. So, so he sort of says, you know, if you want to think of, you know, five things you need to know, um, and they're all things that you, you know, it would be great if you could get a you could get a professional to do, to do some or all of those things, but um, there were there were there were ways of kind of getting getting to all of those things um, things yourself, and, and so yeah, so I think that's a really useful um, resource, and I'll, I will dig it up and, and, and tweet tweet a link to it using the, the hashtag. Uh, I just want the really big, expensive, long project. <laughs> Um, so, no, look, uh, really, in my heart, I'm, uh, I, I'm just a big believer in um, great content that actually does a lot of work for you. Um, and our, we can scale, I suppose. We haven't really got it all sort of tied down yet, but my goal is a completely scalable um, product where we can go in at a, a, a you know, very minor level to help out um, and and work with people at different uh, different levels. Um, I really think a great content strategy um, and I, I hate myself for saying saying this, but it really comes from inside. So actually helping, actually teaching an organization to fish, I think is probably better than um, just giving them the fish. Because I think these days, and I may be wrong, but I actually think the era of the, the massive, big, every three year project where you just throw out everything you had or every five year project or whatever you throw out, everything um, and replatform and start again um, is going to slowly become a thing of the past. And that constant, well-managed um, website um, that that grows incrementally and organically um, is the way things will go. I could be proven wrong, but um, understanding within an organisation how to be strategic with your content um, is the answer to good content strategy. Um, and I think it's the answer to accessibility continuing past a launch as well. In addition to what Angus said, because I get to do that again, is make sure you've got your kit bag ready. The most valuable thing that you can give to anyone who you're trying to prove a point to is to be able to have an, immen an, an immense amount of slides, decks from other presentations, case studies that are pre-written that you can refer to at any time to share with them how you want them to be thinking and, and, and developing and growing in this process. To be able to actually pick out a, a relevant example at any point in a conversation with someone that is that, that, that and I, I'm a great believer in actually going well out of industry for these types of things making sure that you've actually got those reference points those kit bags and that they're up to date and that you know them is one of the most valuable things you can do to try and help someone understand a point so make sure you've got your kit bag well up to date well stocked and put in a few clangers so uh, one of my favorite things to do with um, with universities is actually use the US military as an example. It really is a little bit of a, a shock to them that, that perhaps the US military is at teaching people something better than they are. And uh, Go Army is a fantastic site for looking at, at how you stretch past the audience that you have. One of the uh, biggest, one of the biggest things that the Go, US Go Army recruitment site has to do is get past parents and family. So that is one of the main focuses of their site. So when you actually have an example like that to get across to someone, make sure that you just have done your homework to give them. The other one, the other great one for universities is the classic uh, XKCD cartoon, the, the Venn diagram of what uh, what people are what people are looking for in a university website homepage versus what the university wants to put on their homepage with like I think one item yeah one item um, in common um, yeah um, we're 
pretty much out of time. Someone asked on Twitter, though, about um, whether you, any of you use any content strategy methodologies. I think probably the, the sort of framework that you described from Jeff Eaton might be a good example. I don't know whether any of you have any other examples. Or, or if any of you have any questions, feel free to come down. Or if you want to leave, you can also leave. It's totally up to you. Um, you had quite a fair bit of discussion about accessibility, but um, I suppose from the, my perspective, is a lot of uh, different levels of user engagement when you're designing content. You'll have a user who comes in and basically doesn't want to read a massive slab of text. Um, and to be able to cater to them at a very low level, they get that basic piece of information, but also to be able to deliver information in more depth to those who require that. How, what strategies have you used for that? You actually, in one of the talks you did a couple years ago, you posted one of my favorite examples, which I think was the ATO, which had a really, really long page about whether your car was a car or something else. And it was like one of these fringe factoids that, yes, certainly some people might need, but definitely not everyone needs to know. Yeah, so a lot of that is to do with good content modeling, I think. So having well-structured content so that you um, you're identifying within the structure of your, your your content within the CMS. You know, here's the here are the most important things that everybody needs to know. They then become the the things that are that need to appear at the top of the screen on on mobile and and, and so on and so forth. Um, and here's the sort of supplementary content that people who really want to read are going to go on and go on go on and read. So I think you're setting up a good a good content structure and one that's based on on a sense of the different kinds of users you have. So we certainly use, I mean, user personas aren't something that's specific to content strategy, but it's certainly one of the tools that we use to try and think through think through problems from the point of view of different different types of users. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree with Angus. When you're actually looking at group content modeling for that particular instance, um, I think you need to decide how deep you're actually going into something. I really like short, sharp content um, for the majority of the stuff that I work on, um, mostly because I'm very impatient, don't have a lot of patience with really, really long pages. So I like a really, really good visual structure to any type of content, especially if it's very, very long, so that I'm able to actually get through it fairly quickly. So yeah, that group content modeling is very important, I think. Mm. And headings. And, and headings. Headings. <laughs> yeah. Headings are an answer to a lot of things, and that's what, that's one of them. Skimmable, skimmable headings, yeah. Um, did you have a question? Do you want to say it? I'll just repeat it back. If you've, if you've, yeah, anybody who has successfully convinced a, a, a base of authors to, to use heading styles in Microsoft Word is, is, is my hero. That's fantastic. And the same, I mean, the same principle applies within a CMS. I guess the difference within a CMS is that we have a lot more control over what we expose to authors. Um, so we do have the, ch and you know, nothing makes me. More, nothing, nothing makes my blood boil more than seeing a, a CMS implementation where um, the developer has just left the default. Um, and this doesn't happen so much in Drupal because 
we have to go to so much effort to win. Yeah, we, we have to go to so much effort to install a WYSIWYG in the first place. But you know, you you'll often see these sites where they still have the the insert flash button, um, <laughs> and you know all these all these um, you know um, the font color button and all these things that you should never give authors control over. So there's a lot you can do within the CMS itself to restrict um, authors' choices. But I think absolutely explaining. And you know, there's a, there's a whole issue with WYSIWYG editing is that that, that, that we we have kind of constructed this metaphor for authors where we're almost almost um, pretending that um, editing a, a web page is like editing a, a word document. Um, so we've we've kind of made a rod for our own backs because people expect things to look. You know, we, we, we call it what you see is what you get, and we know that's that's really that's really not the case. But 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 explaining what heading styles are in in HTML as well, and how heading styles translate to, you know, the, the fact that heading styles are defined within your CSS. So if you have if you've set up your, your heading styles correctly when you're entering content, then when somebody goes to do a redesign of your site and the you know your headings all suddenly look different, that'll 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 all you know, carry across if you've got them correctly set up. So, so a bit of education about authors about why we why we do this that we're not doing it, not doing it to make your life difficult or to force some kind of um, weird system on you. There's you know, there's actually reasons behind it. So yeah, great great comment. Thank you. And uh, if you think about it, people have learnt. Um, I think it's just the fact that it is like Microsoft Word. People have learnt to use extremely complicated. Um, applications, especially in government, um, over the years. So, you know, people can learn a new method. It has to actually be moved into your processes rather than just... Um, and give people time to do it as well. You know, this extra... Um, often people have their own job and this is just something they're supposed to do as well without actually being recognised for it. So I think there's a lot um, to be done in that area as well. I think you hit it on the head. When someone actually gets a benefit from something, they're more readily adopting it. And uh, PageMaker has a lot to answer for, I think. <laughs> I loved PageMaker. I did too. <laughs> <laughs> we rem I know, I know. We remember it. But it taught me I think um, one of the things I got from your, your comment is that um, a lot of people approach content editors, like you said, as kind of a bolt-on. You know, they're sort of copy-paste robots. And, um, you know, we need to build a CMS that's idiot proof and it has to be, you know, built in accessibility and all this kind of stuff. And I think that if probably we spent as much money on the kind of trying to create technology solutions, again, it's really a people problem. And I think you, you, you might be surprised how often if you try to empower someone and you try to educate them that they rise to the occasion rather than, you know, treating them like an idiot, then, you know, you might get idiot results back. So um, I think it's really all about attitude and, and approaching it from from a perspective of training and education and not just sort of hitting it with a, with a technical hammer. Hello. Um, I just wanted to ask, what sort of importance do you give to Google Analytics and other analytics giving you feedback on user activity and um, to what extent does that override like user interviews and stuff like that? It's certainly a very useful tool that we refer to a lot. Um, having said that, the the problem with the, the problem the problem with making decisions based on analytics data is that you the, it's, it's very easy to convince yourself that a particular piece of data means almost anything. So, you know, bounce rate's the classic example that well, everyone wants to have a, a low bounce rate, but if you've got a page where people are just going to find a phone number um, and they then make the phone call, then you want that page to have a high bounce rate. So, and that's the case with a whole lot of those sort of metrics within, within analytics. Um, so we definitely use it a lot with, with clients, but um, we would, also, we would always, always use it as a supplement to, I guess, actually talking to users and getting as much qualitative information from users as we can, because the numbers, the numbers don't tell the whole story. The numbers, the numbers give, numbers can give you a, a good, a, a good, a good sense of maybe what the big sort of low-hanging fruit is, um, but they, they certainly, they, you know, they certainly don't tell you everything. I don't know. Do you have thoughts about that? 
Uh, one of the problems with, with analytics programs is like the word stuff, they're never set up properly. Uh, it is very rare that you'll go into a client site and find Google Analytics actually configured correctly. Um, St George, I remember in uh, 2009, uh, had Omniture all over their site, but it had never been set up correctly. Um, I think there's a, there's a company called Digital Balance over in WA who work very, very closely with people to teach them how to actually have analytics set up to give you meaningful data at the other end. When it is set up right and you do have someone looking at it who knows what they're looking at, I think it's incredibly valuable. I have no opinion on this. <laughs> <laughs> um, we probably should wrap it up because we, uh, we might miss out on lunch. So.